do is right now is turn it over to our speakers for today. So feel free to put your questions in the Q&A as I turn it over to Daryl Wolk, uh, Jacob Mo uh, from Green Room Technologies, Jacob Molina, and David Knack as they uh, go through their presentation on generative AI and how to train your dragon. So they're going to assist us in demystifying some of the AI conversation that we are all getting into as we uh, uh, work through our healthcare journey. So thanks for joining us again today. And um, Daryl, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Lance. Uh, are you seeing my screen now? Yes, we are. Okay, I'm going to have to do it in this mode. I'm having trouble with the presentation mode this morning. Uh, but yeah, so I'm Daryl Welk. I'm CTO of Green Room Technologies. I've given a couple of webinars here in this the uh, Austin uh, Hymns chapter and a couple of other ones around the country, primarily talking about interoperability and fire. But today I'm going to talk about uh, generative AI, uh, how to train your dragon. This is a hot topic. Uh, and I want to thank the uh, Austin Hymns chapter for for having us here today. Um, how to train your dragon. So generative AI is a rising force in healthcare. We've all seen it. It's powerful and promising. But would you trust it to speak with your patients? So we want to kind of explore some of this today. Jim, of what uh, what a, uh, uh, generative AI is today and and how it's changing. Uh, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes or so, and then uh, uh, Jacob Molina and David Knack from Botco.ai are going to talk a little bit. So I'm going to cover kind of the the technology and the market side of this. They're going to talk about some very specific. Uh, uh, examples. Um, so my experience in the AI world goes back to the early 90s at MCC Research Consortium here in Austin. I started a project called the InfoSleuth Intelligent Agent Project. We were designing and implementing distributed software agents that collaborate with people and other agents to gather and analyze information in the World Wide Web. And this meant that we had to have intelligent agents that could think like people. So we were using ontology for giving knowledge to the to the agents and then working in the distributed environment. Uh, my career since then uh, has been more in the, the traditional database management problems world. So uh, occasionally drawn back into the AI world. The last time this happened was a few months ago in January when ChatGPT from OpenAI went live to millions of people. Uh, to be honest with you, I was blown away by it and intrigued with how to harness its power. And I talked to Kristen Norton, our Green Room CEO, and she suggested that ChatGBT reminded her of the 2010 movie, How to Train Your Dragon. Uh, and so we have this generative AI dragon, we're trying to figure out how, could, how we can harness it. So keep that analogy in mind today as we continue our discussion. Uh, once I finish kind of talking in general, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Jacob and David to uh, talk about uh, what they're doing with generative AI. So uh, the screen you're looking at now is a Venn diagram that kind of tries to cover uh, the world of AI and how uh, generative AI fits in. So there's numbers of subcategories of generative AI. Uh, and we're dealing with the this little red box in the middle, the generative AI, GAI. Uh, down towards the bottom, I've, I've got some red descriptions of machine learning, deep learning, and generative AI. Let me just cover those for a minute here, sort of set the, the stage. Machine learning is different from other software. So rather than programmers coding algorithms to solve a problem, um, machine learning automatically learns patterns and algorithms from a training data set. And then it uses that model to, do, to find patterns in future data sets to make predictions. For, and a good example of that in the healthcare world is creating a model, a machine learning model that's trained on data about hospital patients, consists of patients' conditions and indication of whether that patient was readmitted to the hospital. You can then use that model when you encounter a new patient that's being discharged uh, to predict what's the, the probability that that new patient will be readmitted. Uh, deep, deep learning is similar to machine learning, but creates the model using layers of artificial neural networks make predictions. So the word artificial neural networks have been around since the 50s, uh, but more recently deep learning has harnessed a lot of that power in layers to do, to do predictions. Then generative AI at the bottom then 
uh, also learns patterns in a training data set, but doesn't use that to make predictions, but rather uses the model to generate new data with similar con characteristics to the original data. And hence, that's the name uh, generative AI. Uh, so in the lower right-hand corner of my slide is something called artificial general intelligence. And you'll hear this talked about occasionally, and this is uh, uh, kind of a hot topic and a very far future topic. And this is when people talk about the singularity where the AI kind of takes off on its own. Uh, so uh, that requires self-awareness, consciousness, a lot of capabilities that our AI doesn't have today. But I show it in the lower right-hand corner along with an arrow pointing to it. What's missing on my slide in the Venn diagram is something called symbolic reasoning AI. This is the other side of the world uh, from the statistical probability AI that generative AI is. And a, the best example of this is a project called Psych that was started at MCC uh, back in the uh, early 80s by Doug Lennett. And this, so Psych works with symbolic reasoning. So rather than statistically trying to, to uh, predict, uh, it, it works with uh, symbolic logic. Uh, and the psych project has been building a psych knowledge base for the last four decades. They have 2,000 person years of entering common sense and general model. So it's, it's I believe it's, it's important to take symbolic reasoning and add it to the generative AI we have. That's still not enough for this artificial general intelligence. So I sort of have an other AI uh, so it, as we move through the years, we're going to need other types of capability, whether it'll be enhancing what we already have or, or something new. Uh, so as I said, G generative AI creates new content. The way it does that is, is with a kind of a process that consists of training, adaptation, and tasks. And so the training, the training, the a large language model is what we use in generative AI. And on the left-hand side, I show estimates for what it takes to train a large language model. So a large language model can be trained on, on text, images, speech, structured data, 3D signals, software code. Uh, and you can look at, at the amount of time and effort and cost. It, it costs, for example, to create GPT-4, which is the large language model that's used in chat GPT. So that, that kind of gives you a feeling for what it takes to build one of these large language models. And I'll talk a little bit about then how do we, how do we use those models? So in the middle under training, I've got a list of some of the more popular large language models that have been, have been developed uh, by companies like Google and Meta. Uh, I'll talk about adaptation in a minute. Uh, so what, what we do, the ta the kind of task we can do, uh, can generate text, images, audio, video, software. All of these different types of new data can be can be generated. For example, Midjourney is a large language model that focuses on generation of images, and like the dragon image on the first slide that I have, which was generated by me just giving a description of what I wanted to see, and then it generated the image for me. Okay, so we have these large language model. It costs millions of dollars to create it. Uh, it's it it took thousands of uh, machines to run it. So how do we adapt it to our task in healthcare? And I like this slide. It has three uh, kind of three ways that you can adapt a, a large language model. Uh, the top one is modifying a pre-trained model by fine tuning it with smaller data sets specific to the task. So in this case, you're you're actually going back in and you are modifying that model itself. So this is a fairly expensive way to to uh, adapt a large language model. Typically, is is just done by the creators like OpenAI. In the middle is is prompt engineering, and this is where a lot of the the recent work by by people who aren't building the large language models themselves. This is a way we can adapt that model. So a prompt engineering guides a pre-trained model by uh, adding information to the prompt natural language guidance for a specific task to prompt to those prompts. And I'll show you some examples of that in a little bit. 
And then at the bottom is uh, modifying a pre-trained model using reinforcement learning from human feedback, or RLHF. And this is a case where, uh, say, with OpenAI, they've had a number of people who, once they have the pre-trained model, they ask it questions, it gives them answers, and they judge how well those answers are uh, and give feedback then, human feedback to the model. So those are three different ways that you can and adapt a model. And on the right-hand side of the diagram, then what we're trying to do in that adaptation is improve the accuracy, say for the medical domain, trying to improve how accurate it is. Uh, there's actually a trade-off between accuracy and creativity. As part of what makes the large language models interesting is that they are creative. They're creating uh, new information. Uh, and we don't want them, we could get perfect accuracy if all they did was just return word for word, some source that they found. But it's that that step of creativity where they take a source plus other information that they know about and, and create new information. Unfortunately, when they do that, uh, we have to deal with hallucination. And hallucination is a uh, where the large language model actually creates new information <clears throat> that's not accurate, <clears throat> that's not true. And it looks true. It looks like it's it's uh, accurate, but if you dig into it, it's not accurate. So those are kind of a three balancing act we have. Um, what I don't have on the slide then is is the uh, kind of uh, something that that Botko will talk about uh, because we have a uh, we have APIs to these large language models. We can build systems that will access, say, chat GPT, but not be solely dependent on chat GPT for the knowledge, because those systems can also access my enterprise database, or maybe a smaller model I've trained <clears throat> specifically on my enterprise data. So, and then use chat GPT selectively to improve the interaction or to, to add a little bit of, of knowledge to it. And Botco AI will talk about how their chatbots are, are doing that. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but this is a shows where it's kind of where the investment, the dollar investments are going into AI applications. <clears throat> and you can see <clears throat> we've got uh, five different uh, areas, uh, sectors. You see a lot of the uh, money's going into life sciences and clinician facing. Uh, and in, in the case of Botco with chatbots has, has a role in a number of these different sectors. Uh, if you're interested in, in digging into this more, uh, feel free to contact me about uh, opportunities in any of these sectors. We can talk about who these companies are and, and, and how they could uh, uh, help in, in the kind of applications you have. Now, the next slide is, is kind of the same information, but it's it's looking at, at, at where these types of applications are today. So the x-axis is today on the right, the future on the left, and on the y-axis is uh, simple at the top and complex at the bottom. So in the upper right-hand corner uh, are the uh, applications that are, are uh, simpler and have early adopters. In the lower left-hand corner, more technology complex, and still in the visionary stage. Uh, so you can walk, kind of walk through these and look at where your particular problems are, get a feeling for, for, for when uh, generative AI or AI in general is, is going to be, be helping that. Uh, if you're interested in digging into this more, uh, our Bob Teague, who's a chief medical officer for Green Room, is putting together a series of blogs that'll be coming out, I think this week, that kind of dig into this from a physician's point of view. Uh, what are the things that are missing? What are the problems uh, in, in AI today? Okay, so let me talk a little bit about a couple of, of, of medical applications, and then I'll turn it over to, to Jacob and, and David. Uh, when uh, ChatGP first uh, came on the scene late last year, early next year, this year, uh, OpenAI was the first company to release ChatGPT uh, and that generated a lot of excitement and publicity. Uh, Meta and Google followed pretty quickly with uh, releasing software they'd been working on 
that that had as much power as chat gpt but they were not releasing it to the public they've now released that to the public uh people started testing <clears throat> chat gpt and found that it, it was successful several national benchmarking exams including sat uh, gre and the bar exam um i also have a couple of examples here in the medical domain uh reports in january already for using chat gpt3 uh chat gpt passed three exams associated with the united states medical licensing exam uh, at 60 percent accuracy which is is considered passing uh, google has a uh, uh, large language model similar to chat gpt called flan palm and they've been testing it on a number of different uh types of question answering systems uh, exam systems and had uh, claimed that they've improved previous state of the art on, on a couple of these uh, significantly. The last bullet then is 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 an example of Google is, is developing something called MedPalm, which is to take FlanPalm and through the various types of adaptation, try to improve its accuracy in the medical domain. And so they're claiming that that they have uh, improved the uh, uh, performance on a number of different tests uh, and compare favorably with answers by clinicians. However, there are also some interesting articles and, and reports about hallucinations that ChatGPT has had. And one in particular, a, a physician who was testing uh, ChatGPT with, with questions and got an answer that just didn't didn't make sense to him and, and didn't was completely inaccurate and tried to get chat gpt to cite the uh, the actual uh document that it used to to make that to give that answer uh chat gpt hallucinated and created a journal article that didn't exist on a journal that was a real journal and and author took two authors who were authors in that journal and created a completely uh, fake journal, uh, journal, uh, journal article, and claimed that that's where it got the information. So that that's an extreme uh, piece of of, uh, of of hallucination. <clears throat> um, those of you who've had my webinars before about fire interoperability, I won't go into any more detail on that. Other than fire, I think I think of fire as an architecture that not only has a common data healthcare format, but also a common API and actually a smart on fire framework for launching third party applications out of an EHR and a framework for registering applications. So it's a way of expanding the, the reach or the type of, of capabilities an EHR has uh, using this standard fire. And then fire accelerator projects are using that those standards then to create uh, standardized uh, uh, processes, for example, the Vinci, the Vinci Fire Accelerator is using Smart on Fire CDS hooks to coordinate prior authorization between providers and insurance companies. So what this means to uh, a generative AI like ChatGPT is that, that ChatGPT can learn about these higher level modules in the fire interoperability architecture. And if you're familiar with, you've heard about uh, Copilot code copilots, uh, ChatGPT can generate code by going being trained on previous libraries of code in, in languages like Python. So what it means that to me is that I did some testing with ChatGPT, and ChatGPT was trained uh, up to 2021, includes knowledge of the Fire Data Model, Fire API, Smart on Fire, uh, CDS hooks. So I was able to to test and try out some things with ChatGPT where it was summarizing fire resources, it was generating fire resources, it was generating fire queries uh, and generating Python source code to execute search using the fire API. So one other example, and then I'll turn it over to, to the guys. Uh, for the last uh, three years, I've been a uh, guest lecturer at the uh, uh, UT School of Information, uh, primarily talking about interoperability. Uh, but this past spring, uh, we had a collaboration on, on some research projects in the School of Information with Dr. Ding and her students. Uh, 
uh, using chat GPT. So a couple of projects I want to talk about here. One is uh, generative AI for training one true health care navigators. So one true health is a local Austin startup company that has care navigators that uh, regularly communicate with patients to check on their status, encourage good health and wellness habits. So one true health provided the students with a mock transcript of a conversation between a care navigator and, and a patient. And the students then used that mock uh, transcript, provided that in a prompt to chat GPT and uh, used various templates to get uh, investigate how chat GPT could be used to train care navigators by interacting with the user by playing the role of either a care navigator or a patient. And uh, that was was somewhat successful. Uh, they also asked the uh, at chat GPT to create a uh, a scoring a, a scoring matrix for things like how empathetic uh, how much empathy the uh, the care navigator had for the, for the patient, and to score conversations on that. Uh, and ChatGPT did a pretty good job of kind of coming up with the matrix and then scoring. Uh, it also, uh, they had problems with it because when they tried to get it to play the role of a patient, if it didn't think the care navigator was doing a good job, it would switch to being a care navigator, considering it could do a better job than that than the uh, uh, that, that, that user was doing as a care navigator. Uh, and then the second project was, uh, interacting with with sandwich caregivers so sandwich is a company that uh, helps uh, caregivers with elderly parents who who help and, and to care for the, the elderly parents so uh, the students submitted various prompts to chat GPT to investigate responses to 10 different categories of the type of questions typically received a sandwich to see how chat GPT could help in the interactions uh, with with fam elder with the uh, caregivers uh, so students scored the chat GPT responses to various prompt structures and suggested options for leveraging chat GPT service in sandwich services. And this included the use of Botco AI, InstaChat, to incorporate sandwich-specific documentation in the chatbot conversations. So this is uh, where I want to turn it over then to, to Jacob and, and uh, David to talk about uh, what they've done with with uh, other companies in uh, similar to Sandwich, and how they're they're helping those those companies to uh, to uh, leverage generative AI. So let me, let me stop sharing. And uh, Jacob, if you can take over. Yeah, uh, Jacob, I can kind of. Um kick things off. I, I imagine, um, and first of all, David Knack, I'm account executive with Botco AI, uh, have really enjoyed uh, getting to know all the folks over at uh, the Green Room and uh, have worked with Daryl on a, a few different projects um, and are currently building some chatbots together using our platform. So uh, everybody on this webinar, I'm sure already knows uh, what good folks they are, but we've really enjoyed working together. Uh, I've learned a lot um, uh, specifically in kind of this data interoperability, uh, where are these things hopefully going towards? And uh, I know uh, Daryl and the team are doing a lot to really uh, push interoperability further. Um, I've got Jacob Molina, who's our uh, product manager at Botco AI, uh, based out of Montreal in Canada. And uh, just uh, briefly before I turn it over to him, just wanted to share um, that, you know, what we hear from the market right now is that uh, typically healthcare organizations are thinking about ways to implement AI and have already implemented AI in a lot of very uh, back office, uh, pattern recognition, um, algorithm types of ways, right? How do we identify patterns and inform caregivers, inform operations personnel better? Um, what I think the next step is, and that the chat GPT uh, built a business case for and also made all of us a little bit nervous was how do we use the computing power of generative AI and these large language models to carry on different types of interactions with patients. And like Daryl said at the beginning, sure, everybody here, I'm sure, has, has played with ChatGPT, has tested some of the capabilities of LLMs, 
but would you trust that to interact with your patients? And so that's kind of the context that Botco AI finds itself with. And, and I brought Jacob on in part to share what are the things that we've done at Botco AI to make us feel comfortable um, in trusting the computing power of LLM to uh, our customers who are using our chatbots to interact with patients uh, on their behalf. So Jacob, uh, take it away. Yeah, so thanks for the intro, uh, David. So um, yeah, so I just wanna walk you guys through um, uh, a chart here, a graph here that um, explains kind of the um, the way our system works in, in conjunction with um, uh, large language models. So this is a very simplified version of it. Uh, this is kind of the version that David uh, will, and the sales team will typically uh, show um, prospects uh, going in, but I think because we have a, a slightly more technical team here, and, and um, I think I think we can go into into the weeds and, and, and get a bit more familiar with exactly what that means. And so, um, if you go on the next slide, David, I can I can show um, exactly what's happening. Um, so, so the idea here is that when a user sh uh, shares a message, um, the first step that we have um, to prevent, because what you'll see in, in this chart, there's a couple of guardrails here, because the biggest thing here is is preventing hallucination. Um, from happening and also uh, not sharing PII data with uh, language models like ChatGPT and so uh, and, and, and not exposing that data to um, uh, third party systems. So, uh, so you want to keep that internal. Um, so the first guard what we have in place is what we call our pre chain intent classifier. And so what that does is basically detect the intent of the user as they're entering uh, chatting with the bot and, and sharing a message. And so that way we can we can we can detect if it's like something that needs to be handled by a custom workflow whether that's a form, a capture, or if we want to um, uh, have it uh, answered by um, our AI system. So that, that, that depends on, 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 this, on specific workflows that are built. And so that's the second guardrail, those workflows. So based on the intent, we can, we can route the user to different, um, to different uh, workflows, whether it's the form or getting the, the question answered. Um, and then the next thing is if, if, we, if we do decide that we want the AI to answer the question, the first step that would happen is we would go into our Botco AI Retriever Master, and then we would basically, uh, that has been trained with documents, enterprise documents from your company, and we'd be able to uh, search for those paragraphs in which the document, the, the answer may be, may be held. And so that way, that's one other way that we, we, we prevent from, uh, from large language models from hallucinating because we'll be fetching from your documents, your collections of data to be able to source the answer. And so we're not looking at the World Wide Web to pull out an answer and, and pray that it's the right answer. We're really focusing on ensuring that it's, um, it's coming straight from your, from your documents, from your data. Um, and then the next thing is applying custom prompts. So each customer has the ability to um, touch on, uh, add different prompts, tweak the different prompts. Uh, say, if you're a senior living facility, you may say, uh, your chatbot, uh, senior facility, your senior facility chatbot, and you're here to help system, and they can customize that prompt uh, to their liking. Um, and so that enables them to have a much more um, conversational approach and also enable them to negate certain have like negative prompts built in so that we oh, we don't want to talk about medication or we don't want to talk about this. And so it gives more direction and guardrails around um, the answer that the, the AI is going to generate. And then finally, the last guardrail, which is um, the PII filter um, using our fine tune models. Um, this enables us to not share the PII data so we can, because we can recognize that it's PII data and share it with, only with internal models that we've used and trained. Um, so these are models that are proprietary to Botco uh, that we work to fine tuning with our customers' data. Um, so we make sure that the data stays within an, um, our, our BA and our, our, an environment that Botco and our customers trust um, to, that, that the data can be shared and only certain people with certain uh, um, access can, can access this, um, certain permissions can access uh, this data. Um, so that's kind of the whole flow of how the, 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 the user engages. And this happens like instantly, right? This is a couple seconds, not even, uh, but this, this, this whole workflow happens um, via chat uh, and through training, previous training of the, uh, of the chatbot. Yeah. Jacob, thank you for sharing. Um, and if anybody has any questions, um, Jacob's going to drop off here in just a, a couple of minutes, but uh, feel free to drop those in the Q&A and, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Uh, but Jacob, one thing that that I hear a lot on kind of the sales side of the house is um, how long have you been an AI company? And Because we know that, that when uh, OpenAI made their APIs available, uh, there were a whole lot more AI companies than there had been the day or two before. And so um, 
I, one of the things that stu stuck out to me as I've uh, kind of ridden along on engineering and product conversations is the impact that all of our work in AI uh, previously that had a lot to do with with what Daryl shared of uh, NLP and it was a very manual and kind of rote process. But um, those kind of I, I'd be curious on your perspective of like the work that we did as an AI company before chat GPT existed before LLMs um, became kind of what everyone was talking about. W what did that groundwork enable us to do that's a, dis a distinctive and that people should look for when they're trying to find an AI partner? Yeah, so the first thing is like transcripts. So having conversational transcripts uh, uh, already would already work in conversations um, so that we can fine tune those models and, and see which answers were correct and which ones were not and, and train the model uh, based on, on, those, um, on that feedback. Uh, that's the number one thing. Um, and then also, we're still leveraging all the initial technology that we built um, in those the, the last what, five years before um, we were building with um, uh, large language models. And so that's the top layer, right? It's the web app and the custom workflows, the pre-training uh, and class layer. So these these are all um, key items um, uh, uh, that are part of this this workflow and, and making the whole experience work. Because we've, we've definitely seen like um, platforms out there that are really focused on the generative part. And so they'll just upload your documents and then just put, and you can, you can ask, you can ask a question. I'm sure you've tried to like upload a PDF, ask a question about the PDF, but there's no, it, it's really, it's a really simplistic uh, version. And, and we realize that in healthcare, um, it, it requires a lot more um, massaging of the experience and of, of the, of the workflow, because um, there's a lot more um, uh, security and, and concerns. And, and, and so we, we need to, we need to take care of those. And so the more complex flow like this is, is better to address them. Yeah, that's. I think that's what's really stood out to me. Is is it felt like when uh, LLMs became kind of the the rule of the day, that all the work that we'd done on NLP architecture and, and had been kind of wasted effort. But it became pretty apparent pretty quickly that all that work uh, is is still really uh, gives us the ability to create those guardrails around LLMs and and ensure all these things we're talking about security and privacy and. Um, you know, uh, making sure that we're avoiding hallucinations and accuracy and all those sorts of things. Um, well, Jacob, that's super helpful. Uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, if there's any questions that come in, I'll, I'll message you offline and we can get those back to people and and make sure we get good answers to their questions. Uh, the thing that I'd like to do uh, with a, just a couple minutes remaining is to share a little bit about uh, how some of our customers are using uh, generative AI and, and other aspects of uh, the chat experience to kind of create this comprehensive digital front door for their patients. And so the first example uh, that I'll share is really how uh, we saw generative AI in action to do some really uh, impactful stuff that our previous chatbots hadn't been able to do. So uh, we work with the ALS Association. Uh, probably most people are familiar with uh, their work. Um, if only from the ice bucket challenge that, that they did a few years back. Um, but they have a couple of things going on. One, they've got pretty significant volume of website visitors and uh, want to be able to create a good experience for those website visitors. Uh, the other thing, they've got a ton of content on their website. Uh, ALS is a complicated disease. Um, there's a lot of different reasons somebody might be trying to learn about ALS. They've received a diagnosis. Friend or family member has received a diagnosis. You know, they're looking to get involved because of some kind of personal connection to the community. And there's all these different resources that might be relevant to them. And so they came to us and said, hey, we think a chatbot would help improve this website navigation experience. And so as we started to build with them, we kind of went down the road that we've typically gone down and we'll say, OK, well, you know, what are your hundred most commonly asked questions? And, you know, how do we figure out a whole bunch of different ways to ask these questions? And right as we were in the middle of building, we saw a couple of things. Was one, they they didn't have like a hundred commonly asked questions. They had like fifteen hundred commonly asked asked questions. And so, uh, if we were going to extrapolate out how complicated it would be to build one of the chatbots the old way, uh, we were going to really run into some challenges with this customer. Um, but the other thing that we saw was that the types of questions that they were getting were really complex. And so, NLP is good if you have a one part question, right? Uh, what what locations do you have? What services do you offer? Do you take my insurance? Those like, you know, uh, subject, verb, predicate kinds of questions, NLP can handle just fine. Uh, but when you get into these multi-part questions of, you know, uh, here's the context for my question and 
you know, I'm wondering about this. And then also this third thing, NLP just doesn't know how to categorize those types of intents. And so typically we hit the fallback. It's like, oops, sorry, I don't know that one. And so what we found is that generative AI was really uniquely suited to answer questions that were more complex in nature. And uh, one of the things that we didn't anticipate and that was uh, has been a, a really nice part of this experience for them and for their users has been it's kind of a place where uh, people uh, kind of come in and, and can kind of dump some of their emotion uh, and the chatbot is able to like respond in a, a considerate way. I wouldn't call it like it's not we're not getting creepy. This isn't some kind of like uh, digital therapist or anything like that, but it's able to kind of acknowledge the human emotion that's in the, the transcripts, but also to solve the problem. So uh, I pulled a couple of transcripts that I've I've seen that I've been really impressed with. So uh, you know, this person came in, they said, I'd like to ask a question. We said, how can I help you? And they asked a pretty complex multi-part question that's also got a couple of things going on, right? My dad just died from ALS, uh, totally traumatized. Uh, what do I do with the eye computer, the wheelchair, the toilet, all of these medical devices the person had? So this is like two-part question. Um, this thing happened and it is a sad thing that happened. But also, I have this really practical question of like, what do I do with the stuff that that somebody else could use? And so the chatbot was able, I think, to acknowledge the human emotion really well. Hey, totally understandable to feel that way. Um, here's what you can do with the stuff. You may want to consider do donating those devices to a local organization, uh, ALS association or other organizations may be able to help you find that. Um, here's some other options that you can have. And so, you know, just from, this was pretty early on and it was immediate validation of, oh man, this is able to do something that our NLP would never have been able to do. And the process that we used to get this answer was, was just like what Jacob described. It's we went to their enterprise documents to find the content sources that answered this question. And then we're using the LLMs strategically to summarize and to make really clear and conversational answers to the questions that are, are shared with them. Um, a couple... Uh, this one is, is, I think, another good one. It's not nearly as complex of an answer, um, but uh, one of the things that the ALS Association wants their chatbot to do is to get people connected with local resources in their area, which they call their local care team. It's like those individual like state and regional level chapters. Like I'm in Tennessee, I've talked to the folks in Nashville um, about specific concerns about like, you know, getting medical devices or finding financial assistance or finding a physician or all those kinds of things. So uh, that's a win is anytime the chatbot can connect somebody to their local care team, we're really happy with that outcome. Um, and so in this situation, this person says, well, I'm a nurse educator. Here's what I'd like. And so then, uh, great, here's who can provide you with pamphlets and other kinds of educational material for people. Uh, did that answer your question? Yes. Great. What would you like to do next? And they picked, right, contact their local care team. So not nearly as complex or emotionally charged of a question, but the answer drove the exact right CTA that, that this customer is looking for. Um, so I've, I've got just a couple that I want to mention that are a little less heavy on the generative AI side that are things that our chatbot is doing um, that's really impactful for our customers. And, uh, you know, if any of these things are interested, are interesting to, to folks on this call, um, they're good to think about. They're good to think about how they would be incorporated in your pipeline, but they're also things that we're, we're doing to help uh, others of our customers. So the first one of those things is, is uh, it's great for a chatbot to be able to answer questions, but for it to be able to do work through uh, integrations, through interoperability is really valuable. So one of the tools that we see uh, our customers take advantage of is um, automatic insurance verification. And this does like a couple of things. One, it, it's a good signal for uh, intent in a lead, right? So if you're lead scoring and trying to figure out, is this prospective patient serious? Are they a good fit? Um, getting their insurance information, knowing that insurance is in network and active um, says a lot about how serious that lead is about working with you. But also when the admissions team gets involved, they're not having to have somebody read their member ID off the insurance card to them. They're able to jump right into, hey, uh, Daryl, it looks like your insurance is this. And uh, I you know, took a quick look. It looks like your deductible is that and your copay is going to be this and be able to really start accelerate that conversation into a higher level, more complex kind of interaction. Um, the next thing I'll mention, uh, and I'm happy to share this deck and it's got some videos in it. So if anybody would like that, I can share this after the call. Um, the other thing that we're doing that I think is really interesting is uh, using the chatbot to accomplish assessments. So we have this one customer in Arizona called Camelback Recovery. 
and they offer TMS therapy, which is a really specific type of mental health care. And finding good fit patients for that program can be really challenging, um, but it's a really impactful program. Also from the revenue side of things, it's a, a, a program that has pretty high reimbursement rates. So they'd love to find more patients that they can help, that they can uh, realize revenue from, And uh, but how do you find those patients? And so they've deployed these flyers with QR codes, very like direct mail analog kind of way of doing this in their referring providers offices. People scan that QR code and it takes them to a landing page. The chatbot becomes the entire mobile experience and begins to ask people questions and gets through all three levels of qualification that they need to get in order to follow up that person, right? Have you tried all the treatments you need to before this is a fit? Um, do you score on a PHQ-9, which is a common depress depression assessment? Do you score at, above the threshold where TMS therapy is something that your insurance will reimburse for? And then uh, finally, what is your insurance? Is it something that we can help with um, or is it something that's not in network for us and we can provide different answers based on the outcomes there? And so again, the generative AI is that first layer that gets rid of some of those um, objections, that gets rid of some of those obstacles that prevent people from reaching out and taking the next step. Um, and then once we're able to kind of uh, capture that person's attention and give them the answers that they need, we're able to do this next part, which is guiding people through assessments or verifying their insurance or uh, even helping with referral process management to be able to uh, just make the intake process uh, have less friction and be more efficient. So um, I know we're, we're kind of running up against time. Um, and so I'll pause there. Uh, if there are any other questions, I see one in the chat that we can uh, address. Uh, but feel free to to ask any of those others and we'll we'll answer as many of those. And then Lance, you can hop back in when it's time to wrap things up or, or whenever we run out of questions. So question here um, is about uh, data curation and the management work that goes on behind the scenes to ensure that the models have good training data. Um, so let me answer this uh, kind of from the sales seat. Uh, but Lance, this could be a good one for us to, to follow up with a little bit more robust of a, a, a answer as well. And Daryl, we've worked closely enough together. I'm sure you'll have some some thoughts here too. Um, so the you know the first thing that we we see a couple of things be really impactful as it relates to um, making sure that the models have good training data. Um, and the the first thing is that we've developed some processes to. Uh, clean up the formatting of the documents that we get, whether those are, are structured tables, um, whether they're like HTML files or TXT files. Um, we found some simple formatting changes, uh, removing bullets, uh, making sure that line breaks are, are in places that make sense, uh, go a really long way. The other thing that we do is, is uh, at first we were kind of putting all of the documents from a, a particular customer into a single repository that would answer all the questions. Um, one of the things that we found pretty quickly was that um, if you create several more topically focused, smaller repositories of the, the source material, uh, the, the AI is much better able to provide the relevant context. Um, the other thing that that gives you the ability to do is to not just have one prompt that you've engineered well, but to have prompts you know, uh, across six, eight, 10, 12 topics that are each a little bit different. Um, and so it's a difference in prompt. It's also a difference in data source um, that we've seen provide really impactful uh, results. Daryl, anything you want to add um, to that? Thinking about, you know, how we're we're making sure the models have good training data? Yeah, I, I think yeah. That, that, that's a great question because it it really fits in, in all of this because the, the general problem that I haven't talked about that much with, with large lag, language models in general, I talked about the gigabytes of data that they're being trained on, but there are, in all of that data on the World Wide Web, there are biases introduced, there are, are misinformation introduced. So in the large language models now, there, there's no, there's no uh, uh, curation going on until the, the model is built, and then we're, after the fact, we're trying to, to fix it. And that's why I talked about symbolic reasoning. And that's a place where uh, it's, it's a symbolic reasoning in, in the big picture is similar to what David's talking about at, on a smaller scale. So with my enterprise data, I can go in and, and make sure that I'm curating this so that, that it, 
it's not I'm not losing any information. The same thing that's that, that's happening at, at the mega meta scale with large language models. Uh, and, and this is where uh, the community, the AI community in general, is kind of dealing with this at that at, at that mega scale style. And we who are like Potco, who are are trying to introduce pieces of generative AI in, into our business processes, uh, sort of going back to the training the dragon thing. So so Botco to me is sort of this 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 thing I can use that has figured out the dragon to a certain extent, and it's a tool now I can use to to train the dragon. Uh, there are lots of different ways to to do that. And uh, and, and Botco is one of those. There, there are other uh, interesting research projects going on. And, and that, that diagram I had with the, I don't know, a couple of hundred companies, small companies doing various things are all dealing with a certain set of 10 or 15 problems. And a lot of the, the way you solve those problems are required just real software engineering to do. And that's why I'm happy to have uh, Botco here to talk about at that and to make my pitch for interoperability again, the more standardized the the way you interact with insurance companies, the more standardized it is the way you exchange data, health data, the easier it is to take uh, and have generative AI understand the data and also to have the, the programmers who are implementing the, the 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 software, you know, the algorithmic software that they can understand it. So I think that the the two to kind of go together. Uh, yeah, if we had Darryl, any other uh, questions. Uh, yeah, Lance had a question, which was, uh, is the model primarily for data collection um, or delivery? And then the question, how do you protect privacy? So there's kind of, um, in, in our world, there's kind of two models um, that we're leveraging. Uh, one of those is the the in-house piece of what we're doing. This that big complicated slide that that Jacob shared with everybody on. Okay, how do we make sure that the right kinds of intents are going to the right places so that we're able to um, you know route those questions um, appropriately? Uh, one thing that we are uh, in in the process of right now is uh, one thing we have currently is we've got a a PII or PHI filter that's um, within um, our data infrastructure that pays attention to every um, user question that comes in. Cause that's the only place that we're seeing even the potential for PHI or PII to enter into the conversation because uh, none of our customers are sharing with us as a part of the enterprise documents we're ingesting PII or PHI, you know, they, they, that's not a part of the scope of, of their project. So the only place we're seeing that come in is through the intent classification. And so we've got a PII uh, filter that pays attention to if anything like that comes in. It's really unlikely that it does. That's not typically how we're seeing people interact with the chatbot. Um, however, uh, we do have that filter in place and it scrubs that data. And then when the question, when the answer comes back from the LLMs, it then uh, reinserts that information and provides that answer to the user. Uh, so, yeah. That's a brief swing of that question. Yep. Um, well, that's probably a good place to to wrap things up. Um, of course, you all know how to get a hold of Daryl. Um, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of too. And so, uh, Lance, thank you so much for getting this group together and, and for being a part of uh, making this thing happen. Really enjoyed it. Well, first, I want to and thank you, uh, uh, David, uh, Jacob, uh, Daryl, for uh, joining us today and delivering such good content uh, to our membership. Uh, really quickly, I want to remind you of uh, all the upcoming events, uh, October 18th at the pitch for social, everybody loves socials, and then health equity uh, month in October, uh, we'll have some announcements coming out for that, then another lunch and learn on November 14th, and then a huge day for our CXO panel on December 5th, um, then sponsorship opportunities are always open. Uh, and additionally, if you know anybody who would make a great speaker, please funnel those over to myself or any one of the board members and they'll move them across to me and we'll uh, try to get uh, those speakers, uh, you know, vetted and on the agenda. Um, without uh, any uh, other questions uh, for the team here that I see, uh, we'll call it a close for the day. And most of all, I, I really just want to thank the speakers. 
we have over still over 90% of the people on the call. I think it was a great subject and uh, just uh, well covered. And uh, we appreciate you all. We appreciate our membership and, and all you do to support the chapter. Thanks, everybody, and just have a great finish to your day and a great finish to your week. Bye-bye.